Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out on this crisp evening. I'm Rita Marsh. I'm with Dabbing Kent Center for Human Flourishing. And we do programs in integral health and human flourishing. And tonight is about flourishing in the first 50 years of the country's history around the Mayflower, people who came and coexisted with the indigenous peoples that they met in the area of what we know today as Plymouth. And our presenters are Andrew Baxter Marlowe, Baxter <laughs> Bailey, Cameron. Andrew Cameron Bailey. I changed my name when that? I got yes. <laughs> And Connie Baxter Marlowe. Connie is a longtime resident of the valley. And now the two of them are living at Sunrise Ranch over outside of Loveland, Colorado. And they're the authors, co-authors of this book, Trust Frequency. You'll hear about that tonight. And Andrew is the author of a novel titled The Mayflower Revelations. And you're going to hear some history tonight that you may not have been aware of. So we're glad that you've come and I'm going to turn it over to A C B. A C B. Got it. That's easy. We all know our ACBs. So good so, evening. Thanks for coming. Much appreciated. This is Connie. I'm going to hand it over to her to do a little introduction. And then we're going to watch this film that we made a couple of years back. It's about 20 minutes. And uh, I think you'll find it interesting. So we're going to speak about the syntheses between the European colonists and the American Indian that gave birth to the American mind, spirit, and democracy in the context of the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of the free mind, okay? So we say there's been two great synthesis, syntheses to date, and there is one yet to come that we're in the process of of taking a large leap in consciousness. So we're going to take you on a, quite a journey um, for your left brain tonight. And um, we'll show the film first, and then we'll follow it through. So you'll get an idea of what it's all about through the film. And then we'll give more detail so you'll really, maybe you can grok what we're <laughs> driving at here, because it's really big. And um, we're doing the, our best to to weave some ideas together that make total sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> and her today was like, oh, does that work? Does that work? Well, in my mind, it works. So you can let me know if, science we, guy. <laughs> if, if we are going to be communicating it uh, in a way you can understand. It, OK? So let's have a watch of the film. Would it be worth telling them where this film was premiered? Yeah. OK, the film was premiered in Boston at uh, the Boston Public Library in the fall of 2016, November 2016, mm -hmm. actually, right after the shift, mm -hmm. the big shift mm -hmm. <laughs> of presidents. There so. were riots in the streets outside the <laughs> library, right where the marathon bombing was, and that whole, that whole area, and there were 10,000 people just marching in the streets, November 10th, 2016. And it was night. the Boston Public Library that you'll find that James Finney Baxter, my great-great-grandfather, left money to the city of Boston to build a pantheon to honor the early settlers of New England, mm -hmm. whose principles and ideals were the seed of free government. That's a quote from him. The trust was broken and the money was committed to the Boston Public Library. He did that in 1921. And the trust was broken and the money was committed to the Boston Public Library, who gave us a $10,000 budget to premiere our film. So go great grandpa James Finney Baxter, whom you're going to meet in this film, paid for us to bring some Native Americans and Pilgrim scholars to Boston to, to premiere this film. It was really lovely. A, a, a top um, um, Iroquois elder, Tom Porter, came, who had been a previous friend, and a top scholar, a Pilgrim scholar, who you'll meet in this film. Uh, came and we had a great evening, and that's all online if, if you have any interest in, uh, in following up on that. So let's... Uh, you ready for the film? Yeah. I have a little book here 
from the Library of Congress that contains the will of James Finney Baxter, where he mandates that the city of Boston build a New England pantheon to commemorate the principles and achievements of the pioneers whose ideals were the seed of free government. I am the ninth or tenth generation from the great state of Maine. And the Baxters of Maine are well known there because they were pioneers as politicians coming from their hearts in office. They championed the earth, the animals, the women, and the water in office. James Finney Baxter as mayor of Portland six times and one of the major philanthropists of the state of Maine who gifted the state of Maine libraries and parks and all manner of things. And Percival Proctor Baxter, his son, who was governor of Maine and who gave Mount Katahdin and 200,000 acres to the people of Maine to be held forever wild. They gave away their fortunes to the people of Maine whom they loved. He was concerned at that time in 1920 that the Pilgrims and Puritans had been misunderstood, misrepresented, and that he was establishing this pantheon to be sure that their intent, their heart, their spirit, and their ideals would be understood so that the founding of this country could be something of, of inspiration to all of humanity, not something shrouded in misconception and misunderstanding. I think that the pilgrims have been greatly misunderstood. The ideals of the early pioneers to New England have given to the nation many of its noblest characteristics, which must be cherished and preserved if it is to lead as the exemplar of liberty, justice, and brotherhood among nations of the world. We have reached a period when our high hopes for the future welfare of this country may fail of fruition. If those ideals are not immutable, an ideal like all men, all people are created equal. If that is an eternal verity, then we should honor it and respect it in all people. However, if it is not, then you can manipulate what that means until it means nothing. Whereas you are to become a body politic, using amongst yourselves civil government, and are not furnished with any persons of special eminency above the rest to be chosen by you into office of government. Let your wisdom and godliness appear, not only in choosing such persons as do entirely love and will diligently promote the common good, but also in yielding unto them all due honor and obedience in their lawful administrations not beholding in them the ordinariness of their persons, but God's ordinance for your good. We must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold the familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labour and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work, our community as members of the same body. 
So shall we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. In the evolution of American democracy, there have been two great syntheses. One happened here in Plymouth, Massachusetts in the first 50 years of peace and friendship between the Mayflower Pilgrims and the Wampanoag Indians. This time of coming together gave birth to a new way of seeing and thinking that was not European, was not Native American, was a, a synthesis into something new. The first synthesis of European and indigenous thinking occurred during the extraordinary half century of peace and friendship at Plymouth Plantation, during which the Pilgrim separatists, who defied the King of England and sought political and religious freedom, shared a spiritual connection with the Native Americans they encountered and considered them equal under English law. Four months after the Mayflower arrived here in Plymouth, they were in a meeting and Samoset, a Native American from Maine, came into their settlement and spoke to them and said, Welcome, Englishmen. Shortly after that, they met with Massasoit, the Poconocet Sachem, with whom they created a peace treaty that was to last 54 years. The Pilgrims considered all agreements to be sacred and uh, they, that applied whether it was to other Europeans or to Native Americans, it was sacred. We have found the Indians very faithful in their covenant of peace with us, very loving and ready to pleasure us. We often go to them and they come to us. Some of us have been 50 miles by land in the country with them. Not only the greatest king amongst them, called Massasoit, but also all the princes and peoples round about us have either made suit unto us or been glad of any occasion to make peace with us, so that seven of them at once have sent their messengers to us to that end, so that there is now great peace amongst the Indians themselves, which was not formerly, neither would have been but for us. And we, for our parts, walk as peaceably and safely in the wood as in the highways in England. We entertain them familiarly in our houses, and they as friendly bestowing their venison on us. In 1675, Metacom's rebellion also known as King Philip's War, terminated the half century of peace and friendship established by treaty in 1621. Well armed and well prepared, Metacom set in motion the bloodiest war per capita in American history. In the end, the settlers prevailed. The Indians shifted from friend to enemy and essentially disappeared from New England history. The war set the stage for the denigration and fear of the Indian and led, ultimately, to their treatment as second-class citizens throughout North America. The Plymouth paradigm was destroyed. As an American Indian, and I look back at these days of our first history, I just think it's a shame that the Plymouth paradigm did not endure. I believe that the got along pretty good because they did not show any aggressiveness. They were, they were people that were looking for a place to be with, uh, with God, according to their teachings. The Plymouth paradigm, as I understand it, was based on the idea of sharing and everything was inclusive. Indians were not left out. They were part of the process and they felt free to make themselves part of the process. What also became part of the United States Constitution 
was the great law of the Iroquois, the second great synthesis. And I have a little bracelet on here that represents the Hiawatha belt of the great law of the Iroquois. And that is the coming together of the, the five warring tribes under the tree of peace. And this tree of peace has white roots of peace that go out around the world, calling people into this higher way of thinking that the great law brought and, and that the great law brought into the concepts that are embodied in the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. Iroquois chiefs were invited to the Declaration of Independence debates in Philadelphia in 1775. The chiefs of the League of Five Nations shall be mentors of the people for all time. The thickness of their skin shall be seven spans, which is to say that they shall be proof against anger, offensive action, and criticism. Their hearts shall be full of peace and goodwill, and their minds filled with a yearning for the welfare of the people of the League. With endless patience, they shall carry out their duty. Their firmness shall be tempered with a tenderness for their people. Neither anger nor fury shall find lodging in their minds, and all their words and actions shall be marked by calm deliberation. You have to remember that for 150 years prior to the revolution, uh, European settlers had, had been living in America. Uh, and in addition to assimilating the different European cultures into a truly, into a different American culture, they had also assimilated uh, the Native American thought process and had become much more naturalistic uh, so that by the time the revolution came around, there was indeed a true American character, which is really very different from the European character and spirit. James Finney Baxter had a vision for humanity that we were capable of operating according to our higher conscience and that a government that would nurture the flowering of the individual's gifts and talents and dreams and desires was his dream. And it was also the dream of the founders of America, the Mayflower Pilgrims, who brought these principles and ideals here, as well as the Puritans and others who came to early New England, who met with the Native Americans who embodied these ideals, and, and our other founders, the 1776 drafters of the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. They had this dream for humanity. James P. Baxter was one of the leading scholars on the 17th and early 18th century exploration and settlement of New England. This was a passion of his that he expressed not only with deep and extensive research in original records and visits to historic sites here in New England, but also frequent trips uh, to Europe and particularly to England, where he did extensive research uh, in the period uh, English archives. It was the Gilded Era, a time of robber barons, gold rushes, and manifest destiny. The American Indian had been subdued. Many had been pushed west and relegated to reservations. The importance of the Native American in the evolution of American democracy and the American mind and spirit had been lost, as the European materialist mindset under the doctrine of discovery steamrolled across the continent. The principles and ideals articulated by Pilgrim and Puritan leaders Robinson and Winthrop, equal and just laws serving the common good, had become tools of dominance, separation, and ultimately world power. In 1846, a young transcendentalist and abolitionist refused to pay his poll tax. Henry David Thoreau spent a night in jail for this offense and subsequently wrote the treaty's civil disobedience. Thoreau was a rational mystic who saw humanity's potential to operate from his higher conscience with reverence for the natural world, freedom to challenge a government gone astray, 
and the ability to actualize the ideals of liberty, equality, and justice for all. In 1901, Theodore Roosevelt, a privileged member of the ruling class, was elected president. He fought the monopolies that were running the country. As a progressive, he used the power of government to regulate big business, protect workers and the environment, and clean up corrupt politics. He highlighted the immense importance of nature to the human spirit with the establishment of the National Parks System. In the 17, 18, and 1900s, it was believed that the American Indian had no religion, no redeeming characteristics. Edward S. Curtis was a friend of Roosevelt's and was funded by J.P. Morgan. Curtis dedicated his life to photographing and recording the vanishing Native American cultures in the West to show the world their profound spirituality and the importance of their way of life. In the 1830s, Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter portrayed the Puritans as heartless bigots whose strict religious views were law. The myth of Rousseau's noble savage took hold. Washington Irving in Philip of Poconocet, Howard Zinn in The People's History of the United States, and others have continued the trend to the present day. By 1920, the 300th anniversary of the landing of the Mayflower, Sentiment in the United States had shifted. Rather than hold high the lofty ideals of the Pilgrims and the Puritans, they were seen as intolerant, rigid, and hateful. The coming of the white man had been recast as an invasion of materialism, displacing a romanticized indigenous culture living in balance with each other and their environment. New England history and the origin story of the United States is now a morass of misinformation, revisionist history, distorted oral history, opinion, guilt, anger, shame, and blame. James Finney Baxter saw a vital need to keep the historical facts and the ideals of the vision that became the United States available to the population, incoming immigrants as well as descendants of the first comers. He thought a bricks and mortar building would preserve the principles and ideals that animated the early settlers. He believed that by the year 2020, his bequest would have reached a million dollars and a foundation would have been laid for such an edifice, a New England pantheon. When uh, Percival P. Baxter died in 1969, um, his will included a provision that the city of Boston was to receive uh, $200,000 to be added uh, to whatever funds his father had given uh, to create uh, the New England Pantheon. The 1960s brought resistance to the emptiness and materialism of the status quo and an interest in the spiritual ways of the Native Americans and the civil rights of the African American. A dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. By 1970, the angry voice of the American Indian began to be heard and felt deep within the American psyche. A wrong had been done. A culture had been decimated. The first Americans were ignored, feared, and deprived of their land and self-respect. Rather than liberty, equality, and justice, the corruption of the principles and ideals of the founders of New England and those of the Native Americans they encountered by money, power, and progress had prevailed and continues to prevail today. The United States struggles to be proud of its founders, 
and the promises we made in the freedom documents of the United States, the Mayflower Compact, the Declaration of Independence, the United States Constitution, and the Emancipation Proclamation. But that pride is tarnished by our inability to live up to these promises. The United States has lost its self-respect and the respect of the world. We're making the sacrifice on behalf of those that don't have a voice, the silent nation, the animals, and the trees, and the land, and the water. But we're in the time of prophecy, and our ancestors said the time would come when we would be reduced to almost nothing. But there will be certain things that will begin to happen in our world. And the spiritual resurrection and the Aboriginal knowledge and wisdom of this land would come up. And we would help our brothers and sisters to understand who they are, where do they come from, why are they here, and where are we going when we leave this place. And when we understand that, it's true. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all beautiful. We all have something to offer while we are here in this time. There is an opportunity now, at the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Mayflower, and in 2030, the 400th anniversary of the founding of Boston. It is time to move forward. It is time to take the inspiration of the intercultural syntheses of the first 50 years of peace and friendship modeled by Plymouth Colony and the melding of the great law of the Iroquois into the Constitution to the next level. It is time to respect, honor, and understand the American Indian point of view and way of life. It is time to welcome the visionary Indian to the table through an open-hearted and open-minded invitation to sit in council together and explore how we are going to realize the principles and ideals so treasured by the founders of this nation, by James Finney Baxter and his son Percival, by the American Indian, and by all people who dream of bringing universal liberty, equality, and justice from the realm of possibility into actualization. It is time for a third great synthesis. I believe that um, if the Indians and the white man would sit down and talk, it would be a mess better world. It has to come from the heart, from the spirit, from the mind of people of conscience. There's only one creator, which is leading us all. And that's what makes us all one. When that reconciliation catches fire, it will jump the oceans. We do have to take care of Mother Earth and clean up our ways and respect one another and love one another. That's all it takes. See the day, because it starts with you and it starts with me, and it has begun this moment, and nothing will stop it, because this sacred spirit fire wants to heal the entire human race, and it shall be done. Once we recognize the role of the American Indian in the evolution of the United States of America, the dream for humanity carried to these shores by the early settlers of New England and Virginia will be realized. In alignment with the vision of my great-great-grandfather, James Finney Baxter, that we lead the world as exemplars in liberty, justice, and equality. Until that time, the United States, like a three-legged stool missing one of its legs, is out of balance without the Native American at the table.
Does anybody have any thoughts or questions at this point? Do you know what brought on the war with the King Philip X? Yeah, well, thousands of people came. The Puritans came, the, the whole thing population-wise. And what happened was that the, the Massasoit and William Bradford, who were the governors, the chief and the governors, um, were high-vibe people, okay? And they kept their people in peace. And, and so, like, just today, there are people at different levels of consciousness. So um, the people who followed, the peop their children, you know, it was a, it was a seed-planting time while well, they were alive, but the pressures of everything just ultimately the Indians were like, okay, let's get rid of these folks. And they, it was just too late to, for such, such a thing. And for, as far as we're concerned, it all happened for a reason, us coming, the Europeans coming together with the Native Americans with this, for the synthesis. The, the Native Americans were at war with each other uh, long since, as you know. So it's not like it was peace-loving people that the that these horrible white people came to these peace-loving people and disrupted everything. We were all in a lower frequency doing nasty things to each other, including the Native Americans and all colors of man. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, and it was the bloodiest per capita war on, on American soil and ultimately it was a, really a civil war because they'd been living together for a whole generation, 50 years. And so the um, Civil War was between friends and, you know, it, it wasn't just them against us. You know, it was, it was brother, you know, friend against friend. So it was my, way more complex than um, meets the eye. So... You ready to go, believe it or not? Yeah. Okay. So what we're... Um, going to do, does anybody want to get up and stretch or anything and wave your um, arms around, wave your arms around and <laughs> get some go. energy? Um, <clears throat> so as you know, the, the title is Trust, Providence, Pilgrims, Indians, and the American Dream. So what we're going to do is, is show the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of the free mind. And I don't know how many of you are into the consciousness field, but that's verbiage that we use that we're about to take a leap in consciousness. Um, I ha does that make sense to you all? So we have the evolution of the free mind that people can maybe understand that a little better than the evolution of consciousness. So, um, <clears throat> so we're gonna just, um, we just have this funny little, the truth at last. So believe it or not, this is what actually happened. It was <laughs> Batman and Robin <laughs> landing on another planet, I think. Yeah, so anyway, it's just... <laughs> just for a little giggle. <laughs> so what we're going to do, what we're going to take this from through the, a big picture look at things. And this is just kind of a, a run through of human, human consciousness, how we've gotten from how we're, where we were at and where we're going, essentially. Um, do you want to talk about that or sure. try? Okay. Yeah. So, does everybody here know who David Corton is? He's really one of our most marvelous American thinkers, right? And he's fantastic. And so he has said that the only two things that humans have come up so far to really describe reality are religion and science. And religion, as it's come down to us from the West, is dominated by a distant patriarch. He, note, is in heaven, which ain't here. Interesting idea. Who made that one up? And the other option is the this cosmic machine, this clockwork, this mechanistic, out of Newton and Descartes and so on, we've ended up with this idea that this, this is just this giant machine. So those two options, and the, our world is actually, for the last several hundred years, being split into those two opinions, 
and they're hard to, they, it's difficult to have those two things coexist in your own singular consciousness. And what he's proposing, and it's related to what we are proposing, is that there's another way that's integral. He simply calls it the integral way. It's certainly not a distant patriarch or matriarch. And it is a giant machine, but it's a living giant machine. And we're just beginning to understand that as each of us is, you could call me a machine, you know, and so, and I'm living. So, for many hundreds of years, we had Rome and the church dominating, telling uh, Europeans at least what to think, what to believe. And all of a sudden, we have Descartes and Newton and later on Darwin, and we get into this rationalist, reductionist, left, very left brain form of science. Very, very useful if you want to fire a gun or launch a rocket or um, build an electric car or any of those things. It's, it's not, it, this is not an anti-science statement. It's that by getting to Descartes' view that if we couldn't see it and we couldn't measure it, it didn't exist. Very, very rational, very material. And so faith was regarded as stupid, silly, superstition, primitive. And so we've been divided and now we're at the stage where we're a hundred years into the quantum reality that was introduced by Einstein and many others just about exactly a hundred years ago, this was really hitting. And the consequences of quantum reality, I like that term, we learn that everything is connected and that we create reality with the power of our consciousness through the observer effect. And oh, that sounds an awful lot like what the indigenous wisdom keepers have been telling us forever. So it's almost like we're coming full circle to something we as humans have known for hundreds of thousands of years, diverged into kind of a schizophrenic species, and here we are, coming back together. So that's really the purpose, I think, of what we're doing together, Barry. Yes, exactly, and you left out the separatist movements, because, and we're just giving a brief overview right now, but the, the separatist movement moving out of the absolute authority of the king in the church telling you what to think and that it is a movement, which is a key movement in this conversation, to direct connection to the divine, okay, which is native, which is the indigenous. So um, we'll... And what else did we have there? Quantum reality, evolutionary leap in consciousness, which yeah. is predicted by people like Théa de Chardin. Inspiration, the trust frequency, the role of free will. Okay. Yeah, so, so we're, we're tracking that direct connection in into inspiration and trusting that and, and acting accordingly. Would you say that the Christian Jesus is in me, living in me, and I'm a part of the God family to separatist movement, direct God connection? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the kingdom of God is within. Yeah, the true essence of Christianity is so aligned with in indigenous cosmology. So um, I'm glad you brought that up. But that, oops, that's the wrong way. Um, so, um, yeah, the essence of all the religions have this direct connection. That's what, what the scientific paradigm has taken us away from, the materialism and all that. So, um, <clears throat> So this direct connection to the divine in the late 1500s, this absolute monarchy, um, re attendance required by law. It was against the law not to go to the Church of England. And the Bible was translated into English and was mass distributed so everybody could have it on their dining room table. And these people who were pastors in the Anglican Church, was it called Anglican? The Church of England. Mm -hmm. The Church of, they were pastors, they were educated at Cambridge, and pastors in the church, they're sitting there going, wait a minute, <laughs> we're intended to relate directly to the divine. So the Puritan movement started to purify the Church of England, stay within the church but purify it. And many of them realized they couldn't do that, that they would have to separate from the Church of England. So 
That's the separatists who became the Mayflower Pilgrims, okay, not the Puritans. As you saw in the film, the Puritans came in 1630, much later, and many more of them, and well, uh, wealthier, looking to start the Massachusetts Bay Company, and all that, but with uh, underpinning, spiritual underpinnings, as you saw um, there in the film. So the, the Puritans have gotten a bad rap, and the Pilgrims have gotten <clears throat> conflated with the Puritans. So people are not aware that there was a Plymouth colony that had this relationship with the Native Americans. It was, a, it was absorbed into the Massachusetts Bay Colony in, what, 1697, 1697. maybe? 1697. So until that time, there were definite conflicts of principles between the two. So um, they were definitely distinct units. And so then, yeah, and Andrew went through a lot of this, the split in consciousness. Um, let's see, did you, you pretty much. So things were much the same for a very long time on, the, on this planet, certainly in Europe, the, the history we have from Europe. Things didn't change much for a very, very long time until the 16th century and the 17th century when the extraordinary change happened. Part of it was religious, with the Bible being translated. Part of it was scientific. Part of it was exploration of the, of the, the entire globe and the beginning of colonization and the whole phenomenon that we're the inheritors of right now. And everything shifted during that late Elizabethan into... So here's, here's in, the tw in 1200, the Magna Carta, I don't know if you've heard of the Magna Carta, but that was in, like in place for like six weeks or something. So it was a, a, an urge to go beyond the monarchy, right? Is that what you'd say about the Magna Carta? Was it an urge to go beyond the monarchy? Yeah. It was really a people's rights, but the people were barons. So you had King John, who was an absolute monarch, and his main guys were saying, hey, don't we get some rights here too? So mm -hmm. that was the first kind of the beginnings the stirrings. of stirrings of what became democracy. Mm -hmm. and, and in the 1200s, the Iroquois Great Law, the great peacemaker, came to the warring tribes of the Iroquois around that time. It's mm -hmm. not really known when he came. A Jesus figure, I don't know how many of you know um, the story of the Great Law and the Peacemaker, but it's a very inspiring story. I really recommend it. We're not going into it, but I, I say he was a Jesus-type figure, this fellow who came, this Native American, came amongst the warring tribes and brought this Great Law, the, a higher way of seeing and knowing and being and, and of government. So it was, it was, a, it was a, a huge leap that he brought just with information and a way of seeing things a different way. So that's what we're doing with this work, is just bringing another way of seeing to get us up and out of victim-perpetrator, the mess that's in the human psyche, the American psyche right now. I mean, you've just been through Thanksgiving, and I'm sure you've read a lot of really bad stuff about it all. It's in the New York Times and CNN, and. Democracy now, I mean, it's all over the place. Okay, um, and um, so that's, what's, that's what we're bringing is, okay, there's another way of seeing this, and it's called synthesis. We did something great together, so we're looking forward to everybody jumping on board and saying, yeah, I want, I want that reality. I'm tired of this blaming, shaming, victim, perpetrator, guilt, all that. So, um, so... Then in the 1606, from, this is from monarchy to democracy, in 1606, the Scrooby Covenant, the Mayflower Pilgrims, well, I'll just, just say the Scrooby Covenant by the Mayflower Pilgrims and then the Mayflower Compact in 1620. And what the Scrooby Covenant was about, and here we have the Scrooby Covenant, and <clears throat> these people, the separatists, who realized that they had to separate from the Church of England, held secret meetings. It was treasonous not to go to church, and it was treasonous to meet on other sub, you know, on the religious subjects without being in the church. So <clears throat> these folks formed this Scrooby Covenant, which is basically 
the beginning of this whole beginning articulation of this whole process of moving into being spirit guided. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Scrooby, by the by the way, is a small town in northern England. Yeah, and um, I'll show you a, a picture in a minute. But here here is the Scrooby Covenant. Okay, as ye lords free people. Okay, we can be free. <laughs> Join themselves by a covenant of the Lord into a church estate in ye fellowship of ye gospel to walk in all his ways made known or to be made known to them according to their best endeavor whatever it should cost them the Lord assisting them. Okay, this is a very big deal as you heard uh, Gary Mark say a covenant is a very big deal to these people. So this is the covenant they made with each other and the Lord to go, walk in his ways. That's what's coming up, is us walking in alignment with universal law. Okay, we're going to do this thing. So um, that's what they set about doing, these folks. And there's, there I am in Scrooby, and we, we have a... Um, um, video online of me talking about all this stuff in Scrooby in 2004. And this is the Scrooby Manor where they met um, William Brewster, one of the leaders of the, of the pilgrims. His dad worked for the, for the government and they had access to the, and they lived in this um, Scrooby Manor and he held these secret meetings. So it's a very dramatic story, really highly recommended. And, um, pursuing it further. So, <clears throat> basically the Pilgrim Trail, where we'll just run through that, the Scrooby Covenant in 1606, in 1609, escaped from England. They had to escape. It was against the law to leave England, and it was against the law to stay. So they had to sell all their possessions. It's moms, dads, and kids, you know, folks, okay, King James, forget it. We've got more important work to do than hang around here. So they sold all their possessions and had to escape and they were betrayed and thrown in jail and um, it took them a bit to get out and they arrived in Leiden, Holland ultimately because Holland was, had religious freedom, was liberal like it is today, had religious freedom and there had um, been a treaty with Spain, right? So there was, there was a, a treaty with Spain that was about to end. So these folks stayed there for 12 years, but they knew that this treaty was going to end and the whole religious freedom thing might end, that Catholicism might be put back on to them. So they decided to leave and come to the New World. And while they were in Scrooby, I mean, in Leiden, they were lecturers at the university, but they were kept in a low level of, um, of work because of the guild system. So these folks who were highly educated and who were farmers and everything had to stay in these low level uh, tradesman type, type work. And um, so they decided time to go. 1620, they left and with this idea of building a society based on the freedom of conscience, mm -hmm. that we could actually live this way. And they, 1621, they connect with Massasoit, as you have some idea from the film. Do um, you have anything more you want to say on that? Or? Mm -hmm. Oh, here's your... The next one, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so here, just give them a real quick shot at this. This is, a, this is a very important piece of information, but we're taking you through such big stuff. We want to get to where we're going, but this, Andrew's made some original discoveries around what took out the Indians before <clears throat> the Mayflower came. It was not smallpox blankets on the Mayflower. They were taken out by an ep epidemic long before. So, do you want to just All right. run through yeah. it? So you'll see something you may not have seen before the first line there. The Massachusetts Confederacy. Anybody ever heard of that? You've heard of the Iroquois Confederacy. There was another one. In fact, there were a whole 
series of confederates, confederations of native tribes. The Massachusetts Confederacy was a powerful, maybe the second most powerful one in the East, with the Iroquois being way the, way the most powerful. The Tarotines War, put up your hand if you've ever heard of the Tarotines War. If it went for the Tarotines War, she wouldn't be here. I'm not sure you guys would be here. A war that's unheard of, suppressed. Google it. There's plenty of information on it. What's up with that? I've spoken to, I've attended history conferences in, in, in New England, listening very carefully. Nothing. I spoke to one historian, a woman. I said, do you know anything about the Tarotines War? She said, I'll tell you one thing, the Indians will not talk about it. Interesting. It was an intertribal conflict that took out a very large number. It was triggered over competition for the trading rights with the, Fed, with the French fur traders. And the French fur traders also brought the plague. And then this war started between the Indians over control of the fur trade. And when the war broke out, the Tarotines, were today known as the Mi'kmaq, you may well have heard of the Mi'kmaq, they were then known as, Tarotine is not a Native American word, is it? Obviously not. Turns out it's a Basque word. The Basque fishermen from back then used to call them the Tarotines, and they kept come down to us as that. So, this horrific war broke out between Native tribes and the Tarotines, who were the first ones to really be in touch with the French, contracted plague, bubonic plague. Now plague, we, you probably know, is transmitted by rats and fleas, traditionally, except under conditions of extreme malnutrition, mm -hmm. at which point it could go pneumonic and coughs and sneezes spread diseases. You remember that old, mm -hmm. that old English? So, was there, the Tarotines, the Mi'kmaq, were a raider culture from Nova Scotia. You can't raise corn, you can't raise your crops, you have to develop a raider technology. They used to come down the coast in, at harvest time and go back with a lot of food and all the pretty young girls they could grab. And that changed because all of a sudden, in the context of the war, they were showing up at any time at all and killing anyone they encountered, which resulted in the fact that the people who were there couldn't raise their crops. They had to flee inland. The raiders lost their source of food. The people that they were killing were the ones who were growing their crops. And in the context of the war, I believe they delivered pneumonic plague, mm -hmm. which took out 70 to 90 percent of the coastal population. Never went more than 40 or 50 miles inland, never got to Narragansett, to present-day Rhode Island. Those people were untouched. But from Cape Cod all the way up to Maine and all the way up to Nova Scotia, there was an die incredible die-off as a result of a European disease, but it was not intentionally delivered. It probably started out with rats and fleas, <coughs> went pneumonic in the context of this war. That's my <coughs> hypothesis there. So that's um, the original... And that's been through the head of the CDC who checked it out, who's the guy who got rid of smallpox on this planet. And he went, whoa, I'd always thought it was smallpox. I never looked into it any deeper. Wow. So... That's that. That's the tidbit, that's what the tidbit of information. So that's... that's all. Now, that, here's what's really important, perhaps. John Smith, Six years prior, in 1614, had done a mapping expedition around Cape Cod, around the bay. And he, at Plymouth, present-day Plymouth, which was called Patuxent, he estimated the population, they only counted the males and the warriors, 2,000 warriors strong, and so on, all, all around Massachusetts Bay. When the Mayflower landed, there was nobody there. Because of the disease, we know it was a disease. The big theory is that the Mayflower arrived carrying a load of smallpox blankets. Ever heard that one? Mm -hmm. The disease ran from 1616 to 1618. It was over by several years by the time the Mayflower arrived. So mm -hmm. that would take a real miracle. Mm -hmm. Just so. doesn't doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. So here so we are. Lay that, lay that one to rest. It wasn't that? Yeah. Mayflower carries the covenant, um, and arrives and here's the birth of the American mind. They signed the Mayflower Compact in the cabin of the Mayflower before they landed and we'll go over the Mayflower Compact but that letter that you heard 
uh, John Robinson writing about forming a civil body politic and all that high vision of what a government can be with equal and just laws, all that. The Mayflower Compact came out of that letter. Um, and so they signed that before they landed because a lot of people want to say at this point that the whole American Constitution came out of the Iroquois Great Law. Okay, it was a synthesis. And, and so it depends on, on what perspective you have, but there are people that say it all came out of that. It didn't, the, the, here are the principles. So it was a whole synthesis. And then we had the, Amer the Wampanoag Treaty in March of 1621. So we've, we've talked about that, that they, that they met, them in the, met him in the spring and signed this treaty that uh, lasted for 54 years. And we have the three-day harvest celebration in the fall of 1621. So those are, those are key uh, occasions that led to this understanding of the synthesis that, that gave birth to the American mind. Um, so, yeah, that's the same thing. The first great synthesis, bringing the evolution of the United States democracy, the first great synthesis, the Pilgrim Treaty, the intercultural harvest, and the 54 years of peace and friendship. So here's the Mayflower Compact, <clears throat> and I'll just read this. This isn't this, we've got the compact and this little preamble that helps you understand why they wrote the Mayflower Compact. This day, before we come to harbor, observing that some were not well affected to unity and concord, but gave appearance of faction, they, they, because they, were, they weren't going to land in uh, Virginia where they had a patent, they were landing in New England where they didn't, and there was some curiosity as to whether they were blown to New England or they came directly to New England because there were churches and everything else going on in Virginia. And um, once people realized that there wasn't, they weren't going where they had a, comp, uh, a, um, a patent, some of the, the servants and some of the people said, hey, we're, we're so every man for himself. Mm. Okay, so there was going to be sort of a mutiny. And here they were landing in the fall, late fall, in a foreign land. <laughs> and um, so, appearance of faction. It was thought good that there should be an association and agreement so that we should combine together in one body and submit to such government and governors as we should by common consent agree to make and choose. We therefore set our hands to this that follows word for word. And here's the Mayflower Compact. It's actually, I just realized today, it's one sentence. <laughs> one, long sentence. one long sentence. They didn't have a punctuation in those days. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. So that's one sentence. I think the whole rest of it is <laughs> continued. <laughs> and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. So there's Widely regarded as the first document of democracy. 11, 11. Mm -hmm. Pardon? I love that. 11, 11, November 11. Yeah, November. I mean, yeah. that's, about that? you know, we're not going into that, but. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that good of you to notice, my girl? Um, so was there no democracy in Greece? Uh, if you were a male of a certain class, yeah. And certain ethnicity. You were slaves mm -hmm. in ancient Greece. So this is a different kind of democracy. This is actual people's democracy as opposed to aristocrats' democracy. And guess what? <laughs> the pirates had a democracy. Okay? One 
person, one vote, one you got one, you share. Got one share of the booty. Okay, mm -hmm. so they had a democracy, except that once they got the booty, they killed each other for it. Okay, so. <laughs> Not a good model. <laughs> but they did have a democracy. Okay, so here we're saying, here's the promise of the U.S. of A. Okay, and we're saying the U.S. of A. is us, you and me. We are here to realize this promise. Okay, um, <clears throat> the true the true American dream, which is humanity's birthright. Okay, that's that's my belief and my knowing that it is our birthright. It's been corrupted by our low-level, scarcity-based, reductionist, materialist thinking, but it's been a process of getting there. So it's all good. Um, so here's what the pilgrims brought with their, their vision. The consent of the governed, self-determination, separation of church and state, <clears throat> equal and just laws serving the common good, liberty, justice, equality, and abundance for all, in a, you know, in God, Creator, Providence, we trust. Okay, so, so this is what we say we can celebrate at Thanksgiving. Okay, that first Thanksgiving, that that intercultural uh, celebration, we can really say we can celebrate this. Okay, because that was the beginning. And um, so here's this. Harvest Celebration of 1621. I thought I'd just read to you, this is the only extant description of that three-day celebration, just to help maybe clear your minds of, of any confusion. <clears throat> our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, so that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as, with a little help besides, served the company almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, which they bang. Many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest their greatest king Massasoit, with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted, and they went out and killed five deer which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. So that's... That's all we have in, from an eyewitness report. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> then you heard um, Betty Booth Donahue speak of the Plymouth paradigm. She's a Cherokee scholar, she's a linguist. It's quite remarkable. She's written a book called um, Bradford's, Indian, Bradford's book. Indian book, where she shows the influence of the Native Americans on Bradford's of uh, Plymouth Plantation book that he wrote. Uh, that's, a, that's a diary of the whole um, first, how many years? Sure, probably first 40 years. Anyway, she's mm -hmm. showing their influence of them on him, and that book of Plymouth Plantation is considered the first example of American literature. Now, American literature is... Strongly Native from. American influence, which is interesting. Who would have, who would have thought about that? So this, mm -hmm. this, this is her specialty, Betty. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Pilgrims, so here, this is from Betty. Pilgrims and Natives were as much alike as they were different. Both groups were highly religious and they understood the power of the spoken word. Mm -hmm. The Pilgrims did not arrive with the idea of taking land from the Natives. They wanted to buy it. They lived in close proximity to each other. Indians lived inside the stockade and came and went at will. They visited with each other, exchanged ideas and information and goods, and understood each other. Pilgrims viewed the natives as sentient human beings and valued their opinions as much as they feared their savagery. There was mutual respect. Had other colonies followed Plymouth, things would have been very different for natives and whites much suffering and loss of life and culture would have been avoided. So that's Betty's perspective on the Plymouth paradigm. And then we have King Philip's War, which I described, you asked a bit about King Philip's War, and you saw in the, in the film that they were, do you want to just go into that a bit? 
that they were. They, they were extremely well armed. They yeah. sold up, they sold their land so they could buy the latest flintlock guns, the, the natives, and the, the, the pilgrims had old matchlock guns. So, and the, the, the native people were warriors. These people were settlers. So this, this war um, became yeah. quite a nasty thing. Now, I would say but that, we're not going to talk I would say that historically it's true that the, if you're taking a democratic um, vote on what to do about these white people who've just come over to our land and putting up this town, it would have been 90% get rid of them now. But because of Massasoit, who was a chief with power, he, and it served him well, he became the, wealthy, became the wealthiest Native American in New England. So there was a lot of good reason for the alliance between the pilgrims and the Poconocets, who had lost most of their people to the disease before the Mayflower arrived. So when they got together, and think about the emotions. The pilgrims lost half of their membership the first winter before they met their first Indian. It's also believed that the Indians took them in and fed them. Not true at all. They had plenty of food. They were sick. They didn't even eat the food they had. They lost half their people, including Connie's ancestors. And then the Indians had lost 90% of their people. What kind of emotional state were they in? And I, I just think about these two groups like finding. Mm -hmm. You know? But but now we're at sixteen seventy five at the war. So, so all the way along there was a lot of concern on the part of the natives about these just more and more and more people coming. And it wasn't that they were stealing land, they were selling land, and there's a huge big fat book called Indian Deeds that has the deeds to all those lands. It's all very well preserved. It's in the but what what the sons of Massasoit did when he died and Governor Bradford died, things began to change radically. Mm -hmm. And the sons started stockpiling weapons, started training, and started selling, selling land to the English and going to the French and the Dutch and buying weaponry, the latest weapons. They were highly, mm -hmm. they became very, very combative with these guns. They were very good hunters. They were warriors by nature. And so, it was a tough situation that happened when they declared war in 1675. Is King Philip the French? No, he's a, he is um, the son of Massasoit. Uh, they called him okay, King Okay, so Philip. I know. You hear King, I think you might have seen in the film Metacom's Rebellion. His Indian name was Metacom, but his dad said to the pilgrims, would you give my sons English names? So Philip and Alexander they became. Hmm. So let's keep going. So here, here you've got a bunch of information. I don't know if you've been reading this, but we could, we could run through it. Um, it was a family affair. 2,500 English men, women, and children were killed. An estimated 5,000 Indians were killed. The Mohawk came in on the side of the pilgrims, of the settlers, because otherwise the native people were about to win the whole thing. But the Mohawk came in. It was the bloodiest war per capita. Philip lost the war, Philip is killed by an Indian, and his family sold into slavery. Okay, so a lot of what this the novel is about is the fact that the the native people, they couldn't, they these people that they trusted and had in their homes and everything, they couldn't trust anymore. And so they just said, let's get, let's get them gone, and they shipped them off to the um, West Indies. And that's what, why the book is uh, based in Barbados. The book is set in Barbados. So the Indian became the enemy, no longer the friend. You know, I dealt with this in the film. And the Native Americans disappear from the history books, basically, especially New England history. Uh, it should be from New England history. Mm. Um, and so <clears throat> then we have the second great synthesis. Okay, so here we go with Ben Franklin meets with the Iroquois. He, he creates the Albany Plan that's not accepted. In 1754. Yeah. In 1754, mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence, 1776, the United States Constitution. So it is uh, this whole peacemaker story, which I've told you about, right? Um, he, the peacemaker comes to the Iroquois. And again, you can just look that up. Google. There's lots of information on that. It's really interesting. And he's the, just referred to as the peacemaker. 
Yeah. Okay. The if great peacemaker, the great the, law. The peacemaker, you'll find that. The, wow. God, the Dagon Awida. Mm -hmm. The peacemaker unveiled a new form of government, participatory democracy, and a legal system called the great law of peace. The core teaching of the great law is that peace was the law, and the law was for peace. Under the great law, 50 chiefs and clan mothers were organized in a three-part system of government with executive, legislative, and judicial branches. The Onondaga Nation became like executive branch. The legislative branch was formed when the Mohawk and Seneca were organized like the U.S. Senate, and the Oneida and Cayuga, later joined by the Tuscarora, formed a sort of U.S. House of Representatives. The judicial branch of government was turned over to the clan mothers. Thus the women gained the veto power over war and the power to nominate the chiefs. So and that's the one thing that was left out of the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> the clan mothers were nowhere to be seen. And what the, what the Iroquois did with the Great Law and the Confederacy, they became the most powerful military force in the Northeast. They were feared, and rightly so. They, so what we say is, look what the United States did with our great vision. We became the most powerful source of worldwide and so so did the, the uh, Iroquois took that power and used it to dominate okay so we've all been in this together is the point okay so the great law influences the US of A Ben Ben Franklin with the Iroquois um, these these drawings are wonderful by a, a native guy whom I've uh, been in relationship with over oh, these paintings for a long John, John Fadden, John Fadden. So, we carry on, and here's Orin Lyons at Onondaga. Our Iroquois perception, all life is equal, and that includes the birds, animals, things that grow, things that swim, all life is equal in our perception. So, <clears throat> and this is my, my vision, when we come together with the indigenous peoples as equal, as family, and we each open our hearts and our minds to the other, the melding of our gifts will bring a new perspective that is invisible at this time. This new perspective will allow us to see the path to true unity, peace, and freedom. Okay, so this is the third great synthesis. And here's the Hopi prophecy. <clears throat> when birds fall from the sky and animals are dying, a new tribe of people shall come unto the earth from many colors, classes, and creeds, who by their actions and deeds shall make the earth green again. They will be known as the warriors of the rainbow. Personally, I think that's a hippie manifesto. Mm. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, here we have the evolutionary leap in consciousness, okay, that is going to enable this thing to come to pass. The, we're calling it, do you want to... Is this a result of the third great synthesis? Yeah, this is the third great synthesis. So yeah. this is what emerges from the coming yeah. together of the indigenous and the... Yeah, the th something we can't even imagine at this point. Seems almost unimaginable that as divided as humanity is right now and seemingly rapidly moving even further apart, that we could actually change course and unite in this way. So this is, this is what it looks like. The fully evolved human manifests the best features of all previous cultures. We are part of nature, not above it. Aware of the scientific perspective, yet not ruled by it. Tuned. Tuned into a higher reality, yet fully present in the world. See, I'm doing this without my glasses. Pretty good. A synthesis occurs which, which brings forth something that has never been on the planet before. And that's in the prophecies. I don't know how many of you are familiar with native prophecies, but that's where I got this understanding is from the native prophecies. So quantum physics is allowing this to come about because it's allowing the, the, the scientific mind to go, oh, so science can prove this stuff? <laughs> so so it, it, it's, it's accessing the Western mind. Um, and... Quantum reality illuminates, informs the Western paradigm, expands our understanding <clears throat> of the nature of the universe, which allows us to align with the indigenous worldview. Okay, so it, here, here it goes inside this, this mind and heart that, oh my goodness, the, the, 
the rational mind can <clears throat> actually prove that there is quantum entanglement. <laughs> you want to do the quantum entanglement? That's okay, you're doing a good job. <laughs> no, I, you do the quantum entanglement. <clears throat> so I'm officially the science guy. And I have a really quick little story. I grew up in South Africa where I became a chemistry professor and chemical engineer. But part of that training was in quantum. Part of what you were learning was in physics was quantum physics, right? Quantum mechanics. And I didn't get it. And I don't think my professor got it because it's so counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And years later, I was doing another degree in comparative religion and social anthropology and studying the worldview of the Australian Aborigines. And I had this moment, I was about 20, 21, 22 years old. And I remember the moment, the feeling, when I suddenly realized, wait a minute, they're speaking pure, poetic, quantum science. Mm -hmm. Because they're dream time. It's all happening right now. There's no past, there's no present, there's only this moment. And it's all emerged and emergent, and we're in this dream. And that seems to be what quantum entanglement and the other element of quantum science, which is the observer effect, this crazy idea that nothing exists until it is observed. So our, our, we are an inextricable part of the consciousness of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so we are participating in bringing reality into being, co-creating it at the very least. So they're proving that it is a conscious universe. And what we're bringing is another aspect, and that is that it is a conscious, loving universe. Mm -hmm. So here's the indigenous worldview that we'll come to when we come together with these folks respect and reverence for all life, interrelatedness of all things and actions, co-creative power of thought, concern for future aspects of present action, living in balance, concern for common good, trust in a higher power. You've been hearing these things, these aspects, all along in this conversation. Incorporation of metaphysical into physical reality, equality of all aspects of life, sharing, cooperation. So that's not so strange, you know? It's like, okay, but how do we do it? How do we live according to these principles? Well, when we come to understand that it's a loving universe, and here's the heart nebula up in the sky. Have you ever seen this? Mm -hmm. The heart you nebula? The heart, you can find it on, it's like the NASA Hubble Space, that's a Hubble picture. So here we have Wallace Blackout. This is Sally Ranney. That's not Wallace. Come on. Introducing Wallace Blackout. Today we are honored to have with us Wallace Blackout. Hello, Mitakuyasi. To all my relations, and I thank you to each and everyone here and in the television world. And uh, uh, it's about time we all come to focus our mind universally because I speak from the universe of mind and the way we are born, we are born with love, kindness, generosity and giving. So we are born with love. So the love in itself is God and love is mother. So mother is love and God is love and so on. So I think this is the way we should teach our children. Okay, so you've got it right from the horse's mouth. This is, this Dear is the Black Elk Speaks from what? the Brown. No, no, this is a different person. Okay. But he was a spiritual grandson of uh, uh, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. And um, he was in the valley for a long time. He was a very good close friend of mine and mm -hmm. where I got a lot of this mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. So, what we're saying, it's a conscious, loving universe. And we're bringing that to the table, okay? That's not in any books other than this one, okay? Um, and <clears throat> here we have, in the conscious loving universe, we trust, in God we trust, right? So here we're bringing the American vision into this way of being that is based in trust, okay? So here's the dichotomy of the whole American thing, because here is in God we trust, and here we are one, and here's all these uh, esoteric symbols, right? And here we have the Federal Reserve note, which is the basis 
of the debt-based economy that's killing us. Okay? So, um, that's, and here we've got the liberty and the in God we trust. So, in the conscious, loving universe we trust, how do we actually walk that? That's what we are bringing with our understanding of the nature of the universe through quantum science and indigenous cosmology. And so, everything is vibration. Everybody know that? <laughs> It's all flow and waves until we put our attention on it, the observer effect, and it becomes something that we've created with our minds. Okay? This whole shoot and match. <laughs> because it's a loving universe. It responds to what we think. And we actually take it another step. Okay? So we take it to our consciousness. And so we'll, we'll go into that um, shortly. So... Do you want to do this part? All right, easy enough. I'll just read them off here if that's okay, just to move on through. So we can choose our frequency. It's one of our human capacities. We can actually take ourselves up and down the scale of from joy and happiness to total misery and anywhere in between is our choice. Everything is vibration, or otherwise known as frequency. We are conscious electromagnetic loving beings in a conscious electromagnetic loving abundant universe. Think about that. You want to hear that again? <laughs> we are conscious electromagnetic loving beings in a conscious electromagnetic loving abundant universe. You modified my statement. Oh, <laughs> well. It's okay. We all have to get it that yeah. it's an abundant universe, okay? But the fact is we are actually electromagnetic beings in an electromagnetic universe. That's pure science. And the rest of it is gorgeous and I love it. Thank you. <laughs> we can choose our frequency, which means we can choose our reality. The laws, and this is from Connie, the laws are different in the different frequencies. That's key So stuff. when you're in a higher frequency, ever noticed? When you're in that high state, things go really smoothly, and when you're in that bummer state, what happens? Mm -hmm. Keep bumping into the walls and getting flat tires. And so here's Henry David Thoreau, who we speak at the Thoreau Society a lot. We bring Thoreau into the party because people respect him. Einstein, Thoreau, Jesus, who else? John Lennon. John Lennon, yeah, you'll be saying John. <laughs> you know, we bring them to, to support us. Um, but here's uh, Thoreau, most of you have heard her, no, Henry David Thoreau. And this is the uh, conclusion to Walden. I learned this, at least by my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. We can't even imagine what's in this other frequency because we're so trained in this lower frequency. He will put some things behind, will pass an invisible boundary. New, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him. Or the old laws will be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense. And he will live with the license of a higher order of beings. Okay? So that's Henry. And then we've got this quote from, it's attributed to Goethe, but it was written by a um, Swiss? A, a mountain, no, a Scottish. Scottish uh, mountaineer yeah, named Murray. Murray. Yeah. But it's attributed to Goethe, so. Until one is committed, I don't know if any of you have heard this one. It's, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. The moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. We're saying it's not providence. We've moved ourselves to a higher frequency. Okay? All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole system of events issues from the decision raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance which no man could have dreamt would have come his way. Okay? 
we can't imagine. So, here we are. Here's Wallace again. Just listen to Wallace and what Wallace has got to say because Wallace was a walking phenomenon. So, Grandfather, it is the doubt that has created uh, the reality that we live in now and it, and it has, um, we're unable to understand other realities that and you and the knowings that you have about the real nature of the universe it's this doubt that has been the problem from the beginning yes uh, it was told that pollution begins in the mind for having a doubt against a creature so first second or third that doubt will visit you so we're in the third generation and so uh, we now we could see that doubt is here. So that doubt goes uh, around in the universe of mind. Then what it does, it casts shadow up here. So everything turned wild. Because we have choice, is it too late? To change the course? No, we got one more to go yet. I remember uh, four times. And the fourth time I'm going to come back and I'm going to check up on you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we got a little ways to go yet. So we already passed three and we got one more to go. So we still have a little time left. So well, that's why we're here. We're going to take every split second to, to tell each other that uh, we should all come back together. Uh, we still have that chance. So we have to come back and try to understand uh, the fire, the rock, the water, and green. Then once we all understand, it has to be unanimous. Now we're going to escape from our own self-destruction. So the whole world will turn green again, and we could live here forever. We have to stop abusing. Then, then, for doing so, they say we put that part that they say the the well, as soon as you touch the earth, there'll be a flash of light, and canopy the whole universe, and all the sickness that are incurable will, will be destroyed. Not people, and even our dead will arise, resurrect from dead. So it will be a total victory. So it is possible that we could regain what we lost. This is the way we were told. Every step you take is a prayer. You have to live with it, walk with it. Not to say, but to hear Madison walk across the street and back to Bear Johnson and play golf and win a rose and marshmallow. It's not that way. You have to live, walk with it. Your life. Yeah. You have to walk because Tugasta is watching you. And with this power here, that will is in you. That Chanupa is you. So, see where I got some of this stuff from? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so. Let's see, I, we're getting close to the end. I should be done with it. Yeah. How's everybody doing? Do you want us to wrap up quickly, or we've got probably 10 more minutes? Mm -hmm. Is everybody okay? You can okay. leave. Anybody can leave who's All right. ready anybody to go. Anybody asleep? Everybody's <laughs> actually awake. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really interesting statement from, any, any of you know Dean Radin? Do you know who that is? Yeah. He's, he's the chief's, Dean Radin. He's the chief scientist of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which is a real science organization set up by um, Edward Mitchell, the astronaut, back in the early 70s. Edgar. Ed, not Edgar, I'm sorry, Edgar what? Mitchell. Edgar, yeah. Did I say Ed? I don't know. Anyway, no, I, I might have said Edward even. Oh. Um, anyway, extraordinarily powerful thinker, very wonderful public speaker, and he's a basically a nuclear physicist or a quantum scientist. And this is what he has to say. say this is from his book, Supernormal. Um, the book is Supernormal Science, Yoga, and the Evidence for Extraordinary Psychic Abilities, which is what they're studying. 
He says, it is known as a certainty that there exists an unimaginably powerful creator and sustainer of reality, and of you in particular. This creator is unborn, uncreated, undying, and unchanging. What a wild thing to come from a scientist. Yeah. So, what we're saying is release the love. It's okay. We can do this thing. We can open our hearts. We can walk in trust. And so... What happens in the trust frequency, when one gets into the trust frequency, trust replaces fear, ease replaces struggle, generosity replaces hoarding, abundance replaces scarcity, unity replaces separation, new systems develop, new relationships replace outmoded ways of being, and understanding of the interconnectedness and sacredness of all things emerges. It is in this way that true peace and profound freedom will come to prevail on earth. Mm -hmm. Then we have our friend. We can sing a little song. We can yeah. sing a little song. If I could have gotten it, I would have had Amy on here singing, but it was too late. So here we are. Let's all read it together, shall we? Because this boy brought us the true nature of the universe. So here we go. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No, no hell below us, us above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Uh -huh. <laughs> Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us, and the world will be as one. Yeah, how's that for so. manifesto? So here's our last manifesto, that we create reality by the power of our consciousness. And here are the seven A's of consciousness, seven aspects of our consciousness that create our frequency, our vibratory level, and we say are our requests to the conscious loving universe, because it has to respond to what we think and what, I, where we, what we do with these seven A's. But it is physics. So we just have seven this. attributes of consciousness that coincidentally all begin with the letter A. So we call them the seven A's. Can't so, put them into a single sentence? <laughs> well, yeah. See, I'm me and uh, me and those pilgrims. I guess I came by it naturally. <laughs> so I always see if I can put my stuff into one sentence. And he's like, "That's a run-on right sentence." <laughs> anyway, here it is, one sentence with expanded awareness and accurate assumptions. We choose our attitude, consciously direct our attention, align with our highest intuition, take committed action, and allow the loving universe to manifest beyond our wildest dreams. And I've got it on a sheet over there. You can okay. take it home with you. But we can check those when we get up in the morning, when we're standing in the line at the market, whenever, just say, okay, where, what are my seven A's doing? You know, what am, I, what am I reading in the newspaper? What am I actually aligning myself with? All that. And am I allowing? And what action? See, action's the kicker. Like uh, somebody said in the film, I think, somewhere along the line. Oh, Wallace. Oh. Wallace said, you've got to walk it. got to walk it. But our lives are, and that's why the native, native cosmology is really a way of life. They call it a way of life. It's not a religion, it's a way of life. So, here we have the evolutionary leap, higher way of seeing, trust, oneness, open heart, choose to walk in trust, realize the true American dream, because it exists in a higher frequency. And then... That's my was my closing the closing line to the film. 
Once we recognize the role of the American Indian in the evolution of the United States of America, the dream for humanity carried to these shores by the early settlers of New England and Virginia will be realized, that we lead the world as exemplars in liberty, justice, and equality. Until that time, the United States, like a three-legged stool missing one leg, is out of balance without the Native American at the table. So there, we made it. We are one, 2020. So that wasn't bad, because we really didn't get going until 15 minutes. I just have a really quick question, yes, which yeah. I can probably answer myself. But who are we supposed to trust, ourselves? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Who are we trusting? Yeah, you're trusting the yeah. loving universe. You're trusting that everything's happening for you, not to you. You're tr trusting the fa your own intuition, mm -hmm. and you're watching the signs in the universe and knowing that it's a loving universe on your soul's journey to wholeness. That's a whole thing we do in the book. And we actually have an online course coming up mm -hmm. called The Dance of Souls, mm -hmm. a trust frequency synergy. And it's about intimate relationships and how they show us our light and shadow on our soul's journey to wholeness, that it's all love. So, so as, yeah. far as, as far as trusting others, <clears throat> I believe we have to trust our intuition on that subject. So mm -hmm. in other words, can I trust you? How do I feel about it? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can, or maybe not, and trust those feelings. And, trust the, and above the, all, trust the loving universe. Just know that whatever it is, even if it's not something we would have chosen, Trust it. Trust the process. Because, see, we gave an overarching act of free will to bring a gift to the party. The whole of creation is awaiting the gift that we've promised to bring. So, everything happens in our life for us to have us bring that gift. Okay? And to learn to love all of ourselves. And that's what this dance of souls is about, the intimate relationships. And so, it's about knowing that if something comes in your face, it's there for a reason. A person who says something to you that triggers you into all kinds of stuff, knowing that it's happening for you to learn to love those parts of yourself and heal those, etc. That's a whole complex interpersonal relationship <coughs> part of it. But it's, it's about knowing that everything happens for you, not to you. And it may not be pretty. <laughs> so, um, there we have it. Can we can we just end on this? Sure. Finally, a message from some of the oldest people on the planet. We are all visitors to this time, this place. We are just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. If you want another one, <laughs> there's another. These were all I took out of the thing. Bushman of the Kalahari, open your heart to others. When you do so, you will feel our spirit. It will make you dance, and it will make you happy, and then you too will be a Bushman. Mm -hmm. And we have a film that, in search of the future, that if you sign this thing, um, I'll send you links to our other film. It's a, a feature-length documentary shot in Africa with the Bushman. Sign this thing, you mean leave your email on the on Yeah, the, on the sign list. that yeah. thing, leave uh -huh. the, yeah, uh -huh. and we'll send you links to all our stuff, and a trust frequency workshop and stuff like that. Cool. So there. All right, Thank anything? You. Yes. Two things. There's a book called In the Wake of a Plague, and it talks about the plague in Europe and how it shifted society because common people got it that all the religious folks were getting the plague too, so the church lost a little bit of its power. Yeah, and then the other big change was that once between 30 and 50 percent of the people were dead, then the noble the nobility had to pitch in to grow food, and so it initiated a, a, a tendency toward democracy at that time. Kind of in level, the leveled the playing, the playing field. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. And then the other thing is, have you seen the video by Lee Brown? <laughs> yeah. What, the prophecy, Native Prophecy? That, yeah, he, you he, talking about he that one? He traveled, yeah. 
He traveled around the country and collected indigenous prophecies. Well, there's one called Native Prophecy that was given to me in 19... When did I go to Hopi book? Land? Huh? A book you mean? No, it was a video. Oh, okay. Anyway, it was profoundly influenced me back in the um, mid-90s when I went off to Hopi Land and everything. I think you're talking about that, the Native Prophecy? Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's the name of it. And it, uh, He is, was a Baha'i, and it's on YouTube. Um, but he talks about things like when the eagle lands on the moon. Yeah, mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. yeah, it's very important. But I, and I, Lee Brown. Lee Brown, Lee Native Brown. Prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's just old, it's that it's, like it's that eagle perspective that all four colors had each had a job to do. Yeah, exactly. And um, that the grasses would will push themselves up in these times to be here and be present during this amazing time we're in. It's, it's really powerful. It, it, it profoundly influenced me. It was given to me at the outset of my journey in um, the early 90s. And, um, Do you know, remember who gave it to you? Yeah. Michael. <laughs> Michael East? Yeah. Is that his name? Yeah. No, Michael East. Yeah. He handed me, you see, I mean, this is all my whole story of how all this came about for me, but meanwhile, um, I was told I was going to an Indian reservation and I was going to connect with my destiny path. And Michael showed up, Michael East, the Baha'is here, showed up and I went to his house several times and he talked all about the Hopi and the yada 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 and <laughs> all that and gave me these things and then I'm off to Hopi land from spirit telling me what, what, where I'm going and what I'm doing. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All part of the story of trusting the loving universe and showing up and doing what it tells you to do. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Richard, something? Well, I've been, I think in uh, 2018 or maybe in 2019, the, when this guy, uh, he's been reading a treaties between the United States and the Native peoples, and, I, and he, through a uh, treaty, allowed Native people's representation in the United States government. And he has put his way into the, I believe it's the House of Representatives. Uh, I, I think he may be Oneida, not really sure. Hmm. And he also, but, and it's quite interesting, he's, he's found this and, you, and, and utilized it, and he doesn't have a vote. But he can be present in the discussions and interact. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like to know more about that. And the state of Maine, where I'm from, have had an Indian representative uh, in the legislature. State legislature. State legislature from the outset. But I think they, within the last couple of years, they said, to hell with this. You're not listening to us. You're not <laughs> treating us properly. We're out of here. So I think that they actually left the Indians. The Indians, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so um, thank you, everybody. Those who have to go, we're here. So if you want to, so we have the books for sale, yeah. the Trust Frequency and the Mayflower Revelations, and there's also a little book called um, Pilgrims Then and Now. If you're curious about the Pilgrim story, that's a little um, booklet written by Gary Marks, whom you saw in the um, film. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and there will be a Trust Frequency course coming yeah. uh, following the Dance of Souls the, uh, through a teaching platform that we hope to be able to launch here when it's ready to go and uh, probably a 12-week program going through the Trust Frequency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Dance of Souls is a, an angle, uh, is a personal relationship piece of the trust frequency, and, and Rita's looking forward to having a full-on course mm -hmm. of the trust frequency. It was we'll get there. We're learning how to do it. And we had some. There are a couple. You weren't in in the trust frequency, were you? And uh, when the no. with Richard, Richard, Richard was is a Richard trust was. freak. He's a graduate of. <laughs> trust freak. He's a trust <laughs> freak. Yeah. We had a series of evening courses, a course um, several years ago. Okay. Thank Thanks to Rita. Yeah. So thank you for coming.